the hero in this piece is probably another 12-year-old little girl who understood what her friend was telling her was horribly wrong and immediately told her mother. Trying not to come at it from the standpoint of such a horrendously bad person and there's, there's all the bad things that they've done. Why would you make up something horrific about somebody and then say, I love them? Hello, and welcome to Best Case, Worst Case. This is your host, Jim Clementi, with my co-host, Francie Hakes. Hi, Jim. Great to have you, Francie. And we are back talking with one of your colleagues and friends, Paula Sparks, investigator for the state of Georgia. Right. Paula came back. We didn't scare her off the first time. <laughs> Thank you for coming back, <laughs> Not Paula. easily scared. Absolutely. My pleasure. All right. Well, we've heard about your best case, and now it's time to get into what your worst case is. And we know that it can actually be even traumatic, even years later, talking about these kinds of cases. So I just want to let our listeners know that this is something that is serious. And we may get into topics that are, are kind of difficult to hear about, but we think it's important for people to learn from these real cases, from real law enforcement professionals, because each one of them has a teaching point. And Paula has so much experience, crimes against children, crimes against persons. She's seen in her 28 years of experience, she's seen all kinds of different cases with all sorts of different lessons. So, Paula, let's talk about your worst case. What what kind of case is it? Um, again, it was a sexual abuse situation, a natural father on a natural, um, his uh, own biological daughter. So, as a result, because of that, we will neither tell the name of the offender or the victims in this case to protect, uh, to protect the identities of the victim. So, tell us how the case, uh, w first of all, were you, was this when you were a lieutenant at the Crimes Against Children Unit in Cobb County, Paula? Yes. So tell us how the case came into you all, or y'all, as we uh, say in Georgia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, I understand that terminology. I too am from the South. So. Excellent. Um, <laughs> um, it, the child made an outcry to a friend um, as to what had been taking place and, and kind of made the outcry in a way that um, was, don't these things happen in everybody's home? So she had kind of knew because she was older by then, she was 12, and knew that something was wrong, but but wasn't real sure that maybe some of these things just didn't take place in, in all children's homes. Well, so, how old was this child when it started? Um, we're not really sure on that. And we're not sure because she can only tell you that she um, can was abused from the time from when she, she she remembers being abused from early on. So it's possible that it started at birth. Um, we can't tell you that. We can just tell you that she knows that uh, she was, was abused from a very early age and just remembers coming into uh, uh, childhood. Throughout childhood. So from her first memory, she was being sexually victimized by her father. Correct. And so what actually, do you remember what she actually said to her friend? Was this a friend at school? Yes. Um, you know, I don't remember the specifics of her conversation with a friend. I just remember that her friend went home and, and said something to the effect of, um, I think that um, my friend at school just basically told me that she was being sexually abused at her home. And the mother the mother of the witness, the little girl that the outcry was made to, then called the Crimes Against Children and said, look, I don't, this is what my daughter told me. I don't know that these things are accurate. And then, of course, we would begin again by interviewing the, the victim. So if I hear you correctly, Paula, what you're saying is the hero in this piece is probably another 12-year-old little girl who understood what her friend was telling her was horribly wrong and immediately told her mother. Absolutely. That's a good Yes. Wow. That's fantastic. Good for her. Yeah, absolutely. Because we never know when we can help somebody out. And obviously this girl, this victim, was going through hell and it probably was normalized in her life. And she didn't even know that she could actually get justice, that she could, that she had the worth for the justice system to kick in and protect her. And that was most likely because this offender ingrained it in her and took away her self-worth. And it's so horrible when you hear things like this. But as Francie said, it's great that her friend saw the issue, identified it as an issue, and wanted to protect her friend and told her parents. So how did the investigation proceed from that point? Um, the investigation proceeded with, um, as we typically do with uh, interviewing the victim. We contacted the mother. Um, we explained the situation to her. You have to take that, you have to take that leap. And that this, we, did, we really didn't have any information to lead us to believe that the mother had any uh, inkling that this was occurring. So we contacted the mother and we contacted and we had her uh, bring her child in, which she, which she readily did, um, brought her child in for a forensic interview. And that doesn't always happen in these kind of cases, does it, Paula? Even when you have what is very likely the non-offending parent 
sometimes in cases like this, I'm sure you've had this experience yourself, the non-offending parent is still um, protective of the offender. And so it's maybe not even all that easy to have them bring the child in. Correct. A lot of times, um, even if they didn't know what was happening, when they are told, um, either they don't want to go through what they know is about to take place, or they're like, look, we, I don't want my family disrupted. And they will choose protecting the offender over um, protecting the child. Now, they may protect that child, but they're not getting that child any type of, of help that they may, they may need. Yeah, and in a case like this, I mean, we, we all know that because of the, the long-term nature of this victimization and that it started so young, I mean, it's just the, the ramifications of not addressing it and not getting the child help uh, would just be completely devastating. Well, and Paula, I don't know if you found this to be true, but in my time as an assistant DA working these kinds of cases, I estimate, and my estimation could be a little bit off, but I estimate that when the offender was the dad or mom's boyfriend, I feel like in about 70 percent of cases, mom did not support the child through a prosecution. Do you think my numbers are off? No, I think you're around. I think in that respect, you're you're probably right, right around the, the proper number. And, you know, even if they did give some indication of supporting the child, um, I think when they got that child home in private circumstances, it was like, look, you know, we need to make sure that our family stays intact and you need to make sure that, that you're just kind of be quiet about this. We'll handle this in-house and those type of things. So, and yeah, can, I think you're right on, on cue. And that can cause recantation. That is, the child then tells anyone who will listen that everything she said before is simply not true or was made up. And that's all designed to help the offender and keep that family intact, just like you said. Exactly. So what, what was the next investigative step that happened? Um, we did a search warrant at the home uh, and... In this case, the the father, like I said, was um, was molesting this child as far back as this child can remember. And then, as the child got older, he was expecting things of her um, that were quite different than what we typically see. Not not things we haven't seen, but different than what we've seen. Um, asking her to put on fishnet stockings and posing in very very provocative ways. Um, you know, the child um, the only thing the child would be wearing was fishnet stockings or different type of lingerie situations. And then, the, so there, in this case, we knew that there was going to be video and pictures and those type of things. So the search warrant was our next step. Um, and were there any other siblings? There was not. This was the only child. So when you executed the search warrant, Paula, you obviously were looking not just for maybe those fishnet stockings, but also for things like cameras, phones, computers? Correct. Um, our search warrant would have entailed through um, in the areas that she said these things normally happen, which was it was a I'll go ahead and say it was a fairly affluent family, too. Um, so there was a built-out basement, and in the basement was typically where these things occurred. So we'd be looking for, correct, um, uh, uh, thumb drives, um, uh, sand disk, the, uh, you know, uh, insert, camera insert, all those type of things that you would be associated with cameras or video equipment, um, anything that might be on a computer or a laptop, um, any, anything like that, and the phones, yes. Um, and then the, the instruments, unfortunately, of the crime, um, you know, the things that she talked about, the, uh, the lingerie, the clothing, and how things would be set up and, and uh, things like that. So I assume then that it's important, at least from my experience, it's critically important to corroborate the child, especially because if you don't find videos or images, the evidence of the crime is going to be the child's statement. So it's important to corroborate her and how she describes how things were set up. And so were you able to do that? Did the did the house or the room where it occurred look the way she said it did? Yes. In, in, in just about 90 percent of the, uh, the circumstances in this case, we were able to corroborate. Um, we found the things that she that she described um, and we found uh, um, the articles and we did, and we found the room in, in the situations and the, in the uh, positionings that she described, too. Um, you know, a lot of times you don't, Francie, you and I both know that a lot of times you're not able to corroborate that uh, that child statement. But you, I know this sounds silly, but you definitely have to try, even though you're pretty certain, because there's things that you may find that you weren't prepared uh, that you're like, well, well, we didn't expect to find this. It's, it's so fortunate that we have. So, and, and what about, did you find videos and child pornography and so forth? Um, we did. We found pictures and stuff. We were not able to get to the computer that he was using um, because the father, when he was notified, unfortunately, before we were able to notify him to come in and talk to us, uh, the mother was beside herself and could not contain herself when she contacted the father. Uh, he went straight to Home Depot, purchased equipment, uh, a rope and some tape, and he hung himself. Wow. 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 That's... In that, his office. I can in only... A very prominent building. I'm, I'm now guessing that the reason this may be your worst case is because of the guilt of the child who told her friend and then her father killed himself. Am I right about that, Paula? You are right on the mark. Not only do we have a child that has endured... Uh, uh, sexual abuse as far back as she can remember. But then we have a, uh, a father who 
take absolutely no blame for this, obviously. And the child now believes that if I just had shut up and had just endured this longer, then this would have never happened. My father wouldn't be dead and my mother wouldn't be in this hysterical state that she's in. And now look what I've done. Look what I, as this child, have done to my family. Yeah, so, so this child tragic. has incurred so much guilt. Yeah, well, you know, the the worst tragedy of that is that by being a victim of sexual abuse uh, by her father, that already instills guilt on a child. And to have that exacerbated, I don't know how many times over, by the fact that her father killed himself, it really goes to show you how cowardly that is. And rather than sort of standing up and taking responsibility and helping his daughter that he had so badly abused, he he compounded it in untold ways. Um, but I, I still hold out hope for the daughter. I mean, obviously, she... Um, she was strong enough to get through the victimization and um, smart enough to at least tell a friend uh, because she was probably trying to share you know, some of that, that guilt that she was feeling and, uh, and the, the, the ambivalence. Um, and this is something that we see in, in many cases like this, um, that there is a strong ambivalence um, between the, the victim feeling love and affection for their parent, as all children should be able to do, um, but then feeling horrific about what the, the, the violations and, the, and the, the abuse and just total destruction of that child's self-worth. Um, it just it makes them feel torn inside. Well, it really does. And Paula, I think you I'm sure you've experienced this, too. I had a, a case where just like Jim is talking about, there was a child whose father was abusing her from the time she was five till we intervened and rescued her. And she was nine or ten. And her father was taken out of the house in handcuffs by the FBI. It was probably the worst set of child pornography images I've ever had to endure looking at. And as her father's led away, she asked the agents, is daddy coming home tomorrow? I mean, she has, in, she, I saw it, videotape of the, some of the worst sexual assaults I've ever seen in my life. And yet her question right as they lead her father away is, is he coming home tomorrow? So, Paula, I'm sure you've experienced many cases with children showing openly that conflict between you know, victimization by their parents or loved one and the, the love of it, the love of that parent. Oh, absolutely. I, I, more times than not, the child, even in the interview, would talk about how much love they have for the child or the father or the perpetrator, usually if it's a family member, and, and the fun times that they had as a family. Um, and as long as, you know, when the abuse wasn't occurring, they felt that they were part of a, a quote-unquote normal family. So I think we should take this opportunity then to talk about how the sort of compliant victimization occurs and what the ramifications of those things are, because they're not what you would normally expect. You would normally expect victims to act a certain way, but I don't know. In my career, I don't know about you, Francie, or you, Paula, have you found that kids don't act the way you'd expect them to act when they're being sexually victimized? I find it on a case-by-case -case basis, but I think a lot of the things that we're able to find is that children are able to compartmentalize, is that when the abuse is occurring, they kind of take themselves out of it and, and uh, are able to dismiss it in some way just while things are occurring. But then when they move back into their normal family and they're at Six Flags or they're having dinner or they're doing homework or whatever, they, they, they compartmentalize the, the situation so that one doesn't seep into another. And I'm not trying to be from a psychological standpoint, just from what they have told us in the inter told me as an investigator in the interviews. So we find that, uh, that, that children, every victim, are, they're, they're all very different in their response to uh, sexual abuse. So, Paula, we were talking earlier about how different victims respond differently to child sexual abuse. And I think one of the things that would interest our listeners and I think is important to understand is that children are not little adults. And so one of the most important things we do or you do as investigators is, is interview children and try to figure out what happened. Can you talk a little bit about the dynamics when the offender is a family member um, with respect to whether the child feels conflicted and how you address that in an interview? Um, yeah, briefly, for sure. Um, you, you have to remember, you don't. we try not to come at it from the standpoint of this is such a horrendously bad person and there's, there's all the bad things that they've done. Um, usually you find, in, especially from a family, when the, fam the perpetrator is a family member, that they probably still have affection and love for this individual. So you come at it from talking from the aspect of just tell us what happened and talk about the specifics and what would lead up to it and what were the circumstances where it typically occurred and how would people know about it and, and how they would be alone with the individual as, as opposed to just coming right out and 
and tell me what happened and uh, establish any blame. And you don't want to certainly don't want to blame the victim, and you certainly don't want to blame the perpetrator because uh, you may you may put the victim off with that because they do still love these people in some different form of way that we may never understand. Yeah, I think one of the hardest things for juries to understand is, and and the public, the general public, is to uh, to get into the mind frame of wait, you're being sexually abused by this person, yet you love them. Um, I think one of the, the best examples of that, that that played out in the public um, forum was uh, Bishop Eddie Long. Um, one of the victims that he had taken advantage of sexually was sort of uh, ambushed at, at, a, at a store late at night. And when he came out, the this film crew was out there and they, they stuck a mic in his face and they said, why would you make up these allegations about this this beloved bishop? And he said, I have love in my heart for him. Uh, he was always a father figure to me and and I'll always have love in my heart for him. And yet I hated what he did to me. And the fact that he left us hurt more than anything else I've ever experienced in my life. And so he, he then went on to say how there were, there were nights where he couldn't take enough showers to get his stink off of him and, and where he couldn't get the memories of him doing things to him out of his brain. And so there's so many indicators of veracity in that. One, the ambivalence of the victims is, is an indicator of veracity. Why would you make up something horrific about somebody and then say, I love them? <laughs> I mean... It just it, it just played out in the public uh, forum there, and I thought it really spoke to this person's this this particular victim's um, authenticity and and veracity. Well, I think Paul, you'll you'll back me up on this, but I think that's one of the most important reasons to have well trained interviewers and well trained prosecutors for these kinds of cases, because you have juries and judges who do not understand the dynamics of child sexual abuse, and you have interviewers who have to understand those dynamics in order to corroborate the child's tale, like Paula was saying, trying to find the physical things that that corroborate, but also find the internal corroboration in the child's own statement, like you said, Jim, that conflict. I mean, most kids are going to have that conflicted feeling if their parent, the person who provides for them, and Paula writes sometimes does fun things with them, is also the one that abuses them, they will have both kinds of feelings for that offender, don't you think? Uh, yeah, I think you're right on mark with understanding. Um, and the Eddie, Eddie Long example was so uh, right on mark in that why would somebody, why do children or why would these people make up things about these individuals that they, they also express love with? Um, so that's why I think it takes a forensic interviewer, especially with the children, to be able to, to approach that in the most appropriate way. And it's also important, I think, um, that that prosecutors put on expert witnesses who can explain to the jury um, exactly what's going on behaviorally with those children because they have been put in a situation that basically warps their mind and understanding and their children on top of that. So you actually really have to understand all those details if you're going to understand and actually interpret the evidence properly. I agree. And it's it's Paula, thank you so much for joining us uh, on Best Case, Worst Case and talking to us about your worst case. It was a grim one. I think there are lots of lessons to be learned there, uh, both for the public and for law enforcement. I'm sure we have law enforcement listeners as well. And I think it's important that we understand those dynamics and have things like therapy and child advocacy centers available to children like this young girl who is going to definitely need professional help. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Paula. And uh, we really appreciate the work you do. And Hopefully we'll be talking to you again soon. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thanks for letting us talk about it. Signing off now for Best Case, Worst Case. Thank you for listening. Best Case, Worst Case is an XG production. Produced by Jim Clementi at Empire Studios, L.A. Engineered and edited by Terrell Parham. Music by Simba Sumba. And hosted by Wondery. You can subscribe to Best Case, Worst Case on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, or your favorite listening app.